In 2004, the world witnessed a dual tragedy of monumental proportions. A powerful earthquake in the Indian Ocean was followed by a devastating tsunami, claiming the lives of over 260,000 people across 14 countries. Seven years later, a triple disaster struck Japan, when an earthquake as intense as the one in the Indian Ocean, but this time in the Pacific, triggered an equally destructive tsunami. Against this, the robust Japanese defenses stood no chance. The fury of the sea subsequently caused a nuclear accident at the Fukushima plant, 260 kilometers north of Tokyo. The tsunami claimed over 18,000 lives, and the Fukushima incident forced the evacuation of 160,000 people living nearby. It was the worst catastrophe Japan had faced since the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. March 11, 2011, a Friday, will hardly be forgotten by the Japanese. At 2.46 p.m. local time, a significant seismic event occurred in the Pacific Ocean, approximately 130 kilometers east of Sendai, Japan. This earthquake, known as the Great East Japan Earthquake, Great Sendai Earthquake, or Dohoku Earthquake, reached a magnitude of 9.0 on the Richter scale making it the most powerful ever recorded in Japanese seismic history. The immediate consequence was a notable displacement of Honshu Island, Japan's largest, moving it 2.4 meters eastward. The earthquake's epicenter was identified at a depth of 24.4 kilometers beneath the seabed. The interaction between the Eurasian and Pacific tectonic plates caused a massive ground shift, estimated at about 50 meters. This phenomenon was the precursor to a devastating tsunami, characterized by waves of great magnitude. Accustomed to major tremors followed by large-scale destruction, as in Tokyo in 1923, and in Kobe in 1995, Japan began to face a succession of events unprecedented in its history. The earthquake itself was already beyond Japanese standards. In the capital of Tohoku, Sendai, People on the streets quickly realized there was nowhere to run. Video footage showed many trying to escape from falling building debris onto the sidewalks and terrified workers in offices, where objects and furniture were thrown to the ground. The long duration of the tremor made the moment even more frightening. Japan is considered the best prepared country against earthquakes in the world. After the 1923 disaster, which resulted in 140,000 deaths, the country adopted seismic isolation technologies, including rubber bases and dampers in buildings, to mitigate the effects of seismic shocks. However, the magnitude of the Tohoku earthquake exceeded the resistance capacities of these technologies, resulting in substantial damage, including in the capital, Tokyo, which is 373 kilometers from the epicenter. East of Tokyo, in the city of Ichihara, the quake caused a refinery to catch fire and explode. Yet, none of this would compare to what was about to hit the country's east coast. The subsequent tsunami caused the most devastating impacts. The word tsunami, derived from the Japanese terms su, harbor, and nami, wave, describes waves of great energy and height. Despite Japan's advanced tsunami warning system, the initial predictions underestimated the event's magnitude. Japan was already well acquainted with tsunamis and had a developed warning system and extensive protective infrastructure. At 2.49 p.m., three minutes after the earthquake, a first tsunami warning was issued. However, this notification underestimated the problem scale. The earthquake's magnitude was initially estimated at just 7.9 and it was believed that the waves would reach the coast with heights between 3 and 6 meters. However, with waves reaching up to 15 meters in some places, the tsunami easily overcame the coastal defenses, causing extensive destruction in coastal areas. This may have led some people to believe that the tsunami waves would not surpass the protective walls and possibly contributed to delays in evacuation. A second alert was issued at 3.10 p.m., increasing the wave height prediction to up to 10 meters. By that time, however, 
the tsunami was already too close. Half an hour after the earthquake, the waves reached the Tohoku coast and other regions in eastern Japan. From the tops of buildings, many Japanese watched helplessly as the first waves overcame the protective walls as if they didn't exist. Walls of water invaded coastal cities, carrying and destroying boats, cars, and houses, which from afar looked like toys. The port and the airport of Sendai were severely affected, and the wave of destruction extended to the city of Miyako in the north. Vessels, aircraft, helicopters, and automobiles of different sizes were easily dragged by the waves. Japanese cameras recorded footage that shocked the world. About 250 kilometers north of Sendai, the tsunami reached the city of Miyako, where the destruction was equally astonishing. The mountain of black sea water soon overcame the five-meter-high barriers, dragging with it cars, boats, houses, and electricity poles. In the following days, rescue efforts intensified in flooded and devastated areas. BBC News reported that a third of the city of Kasenuma, with 74,000 inhabitants, was submerged, and in Rikus and Takata, with 23,000 inhabitants, the destruction was almost total with more than 300 bodies already found. The earthquake also generated 125 aftershocks, with one reaching a magnitude of 6.8. The human and material impact was devastating. There were 15,853 deaths and 3,282 missing, most due to the tsunami. Infrastructure suffered severely, with over 300,000 buildings destroyed, 1 million damaged and significant damage to roads, bridges, and rail lines. Approximately 25 million tons of debris were generated, some of which reached the coasts of Canada and the United States. The estimated financial cost of the disaster was approximately 200 billion US dollars. One year after the disaster, 330,000 people were still living in some form of temporary accommodation. More than 300,000 buildings were destroyed, and another 1 million were damaged by the tsunami, fires, or the earthquake, along with 4,000 roads, 78 bridges, and 29 rail lines. Following the earthquake and tsunami, the tragedy would, however, have a third chapter. Shortly after the tsunami, the first concerns arose about two nuclear power plants in the east of the country near the earthquake's epicenter, Omigawa in Miyagi Prefecture, and Fukushima Daiji in Fukushima Prefecture. The Omigawa plant, despite being closer to the epicenter, suffered limited damage due to its elevated location and 14-meter fortifications, which protected the structure against the tsunami's impact. In Fukushima, the situation would be far more severe. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, less prepared for an event of this magnitude, faced critical challenges. The structure protecting Fukushima proved precarious. Reactors 1, 2, and 3, which were operational at the time of the earthquake, shut down automatically, activating the safety systems. However, the earthquake damaged the external power transmission lines leading to the activation of diesel generators to operate the pumps responsible for cooling the reactors. At 3.42 p.m. on the 11th, however, the plant was struck by a first large tsunami wave, a second would come eight minutes later. The waves reached 15 meters in height, but Fukushima was not prepared for such an event. Built 10 meters above sea level, the plant was surrounded by a protective wall of just over 5 meters. The flooding resulted in the failure of the generators and the compromise of essential systems, interrupting the cooling of the reactors. This precipitated a state of nuclear emergency and progressive evacuations, expanding from an initial radius of 2 km to 20 km, marking the start of the worst nuclear disaster since the Chernobyl explosion in Ukraine in 1985, in a country that had suffered two atomic bombings in World War II. With the flooding of the sublevels, the generators ceased to function, and other important operational equipment, such as pumps and batteries, also became inoperative. Without power and with damaged equipment, 
the cooling process of the three reactors stopped. Access to the plant was also hindered due to damages caused by the tsunami and earthquake to the roads. On the evening of the 11th, a nuclear emergency was declared and the evacuation of residents within a two-kilometer radius of the plant was announced. The area was soon extended to three, then ten kilometers, and the next day the evacuation reached twenty kilometers. At 3.36 p.m. on Saturday, March 12, there was a hydrogen explosion in the service floor of the building above the containment of Reactor Unit 1, destroying the roof and the covering at the top of the building. These explosions resulted in the release of radioactive material into the atmosphere, in addition to the leakage of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. Efforts to stabilize the situation took approximately two weeks, with the reactor cores melting within the first three days and radiation emissions persisting for about six days. In the first three days of the accident, the cores of the Fukushima reactors melted and the radiation leakage continued for six days. The work of the technical teams was primarily aimed at trying to cool reactors 1, 2, and 3 using water and to stop the leakage of radioactive material. It took two weeks before the reactors were considered stable again. There were no deaths as a result of the accident in 2018, however, the Japanese government would confirm the first death of a Fukushima worker from cancer due to radiation exposure. The Fukushima plant was rendered unusable. Over the years, about one million tons of contaminated water accumulated inside it. In October 2020, nine years after the accident, the Japanese government was preparing to decide what to do with this material. The most likely option was to discharge it into the Pacific Ocean. Starting in 2022, a measure criticized by environmentalists and entities from the fishing sector. The nuclear accident led to the evacuation of 160,000 people from the region, with the affected area extended from 20 to 30 kilometers at the end of March 2011. A large part was authorized to return with the reduction of risk, but areas closest to the Fukushima plant continued to be off limits. Two small towns, Okuma and Futaba, with populations of 11,000 and 7,000 respectively, remained closed for years. In 2019, authorities allowed residents to return to 40% of Okuma, considered safe after years of decontamination. However, many people still questioned the safety and did not feel comfortable returning. In March 2020, Futaba was reopened but only for the entry of workers involved in its reconstruction. The permanent return of residents was only scheduled for 2022. After the accident, Japan began detailed safety inspections of all its approximately 50 nuclear reactors. Due to the inspections, in May 2012, all the plants in the country were shut down, being gradually reopened from 2015. Among them was the Onigawa plant closed since 2011 and whose operation was expected to resume at the end of 2020. Pressure for the country to reduce its nuclear energy production increased, and Japan aimed to decrease the share of this energy source from 30% at the time of the Fukushima accident to an anticipated 20% by 2030. The effects of the Great East Japan earthquake lasted much longer than imagined. In November 2016, a 7.4 magnitude tremor struck the Fukushima and Miyagi regions. Technicians clarified that it was not a new earthquake, but a secondary shock still resulting from the Great Tremor of 2011. The event, which did not cause significant damage, served as another reminder of the magnitude of the disaster five years earlier and the need for the country to better prepare for future tragedies. Since 2011, Japanese defenses against tsunamis along the country's eastern coastline have been expanded. Walls designed to contain future giant waves, previously 5 meters high, were raised to about 13 meters. The geography of the city of Rikuz and Takata, one of the most affected by the tsunami, was reshaped as part of its reconstruction. The city center, completely destroyed by the sea, was rebuilt on a massive landfill that covered the old structure, elevating the area by 10 meters, making it more protected from potential giant waves. In addition to tsunamis, 
Japan continues to prepare for another major tragedy, a new earthquake, possibly in its capital, Tokyo, a metropolitan area with 37 million inhabitants. The last major quake to hit the city, in 1923, is about to reach its centenary, and experts believe a similar disaster could occur about a century later. The chances of a new earthquake striking the city before 2050 are estimated at around 70 percent. While its buildings are prepared to withstand a strong tremor, an earthquake in Tokyo would pose a huge challenge to emergency and rescue services, its transportation system, and the population. Therefore, the city regularly tests its communication structure, which involves hundreds of loudspeakers spread across public spaces. The certainty that Japan will continue to be the target of earthquakes, some severe, means the population in the country is always on standby for an emergency. Ten years after the Fukushima tragedy, at 2.46 p.m. local time in 2021, Japan observed a national moment of silence in memory of the victims of the catastrophe. Today, Japan knows it cannot prevent earthquakes and tsunamis. But it can be prepared to save lives in a future disaster. The visible signs of the catastrophe are disappearing. Across the 20 kilometer area surrounding the nuclear facility, excavators and cranes are demolishing many buildings and houses that became uninhabitable due to earthquakes and contamination. The mountains of bags with decontamination remnants that marred the landscape for years have been largely removed. In the fields and meadows of the region, there are now solar panels. However, the governor of Fukushima, Masachi Bori, speaks of lights and shadows in his assessment of the 10th anniversary of the catastrophe. Part of the light is that radiation levels have decreased. We have decontaminated, today only 2.4% of the city area is closed, says Uchi Bori. On the negative side, 37,000 former residents remain displaced. Although all evacuation orders for the 20-kilometer zone around the nuclear facility have been lifted, large parts of the cities directly adjacent to the plants and the settlements to the northwest are still highly contaminated, totaling an area of almost 340 square kilometers. There, radioactivity is at least 50 times above the standard limit of 1 millisievert. So far, in these cities, only small special economic zones have been decontaminated for subsequent repopulation. Between 30% and 60% of the former residents have returned to the towns and villages further from the nuclear plant. Among them, however, are only a few families with children. Fearing radiation, many have already settled in new cities. Among the returnees, the majority are elderly.